Well, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Today's talk is about IT time series and prediction with Android, Spark, and Cassandra. But before starting, I just want to warn you, you may hear some awkward words during the presentation. Don't worry, it's only my French that came up sometimes. <laughs> so my name is Emira. I am an agile Java developer at Vault Tech. I code in Scala in my free time too. And in spite of coding, I'm also a runner addict. I started two years ago, and my challenge for this year is to do my first marathon race at Paris. So wish me luck. You can follow me on Twitter if you'd like to hear some tech news, and all the code of this presentation will be available on my GitHub. I'm also one of the Duchesse France leaders. Duchesse France is an association aiming to promote a female profile, technical profile, to give them more visibility and also create a technical vocation among girls. So we always need support from the IT community. Follow us on Twitter and have a look on our blog. IoT, the Internet of Things. When I started doing my researches about IoT, I was wondering when all this has begun. And when, when, while doing my researches, I found an interesting report of Cisco. The report shows the increasing number of population and in the meantime, the increasing number of uh, connected devices. And according to this report, IoT was born between 2008 and 2009, when the number of the connected devices exceeded the number of person on Earth. That's amazing. Today we are about 7.2 billion people on Earth, and each one of you had at least three connected devices. And this number is going to increase incredibly the next years. We may reach 50 billion of connected devices in 2020. Amazing, huh? So imagine this network of connected devices, from wireless connection to the internet, from embedded system to the microelectromechanical -electro systems. All this contribute to the internet of things. And all these uh, systems are capturing a huge amount of data. Worldwide social media users totals into billions, and each one are accumulating a thousand, even ten of thousand of connection to content. We can even cite Facebook, who has 20 terabytes of photos loaded each month. And the bigger one is Google, of course, who is processing one petabyte of data each 72 minutes. So the need of speed of analyzing all this huge amount of data, uh, in the most of data are even unstructured, text-based, so it's re really, really hard to analyze all this data. There's a challenge of doing it. We have exabytes, many zettabytes, data available now. And uh, for an, est an estimate for 2020, we'll have 40 zettabytes of data on the web. So what we're going to do to analyze the data is first to extract the information from the data. Then we will use the extracted information to gain the knowledge. And after gaining this knowledge, we're going to enlarge our wisdom. So we're going to have billions of machines, products, and things that will merge from the physical world into the digital world, along really a near time connectivity and analysis. Machine and products in the future will have the intelligence to deliver us the right information in the right time to any devices. And when smart machine and products start to communicate, they can help us person and machine, understand the information so we can better make, make better decisions, react, act uh, very fast, save time and money, money, and improve product and services. Yeah, that's a good dream, but we, we are really far, far away from this. There is a long road to take. Imagine if Pepper, Pepper instead of doing his uh, welcoming pitch at uh, the keynote, gives you your favorite beer as a welcoming gift. Or even better, it can order your favorite meal instead of the crab sandwiches at lunchtime. <laughs> Stefan, this message is for you. <laughs> 
Therefore, I'm not going to go far away in the future. I'm just going to share my favorite connected devices. As I said in the beginning, I'm addicted to running. So when I started running, I used a lot of devices. First, I used my smartphone as each one of you. I uploaded RunKeeper application, which allows me to measure a lot of metrics. My acceleration, the calorie I consume, the distance, the elevation, etc. But it was really hard to do my running with an armband. The, the phone keep moving, sometimes it fell down. So last Christmas, Santa sent, gave me a very great, great for, uh, very precious gift. It was my Garmin watch, my first Garmin watch. I use it since. And the Garmin watch really helps me have my instantly acceleration, the time to rest after a physical activity, and a lot of, all me of other metrics. And even better, I can synchronize all the data from my watch into my phone or the website directly. And recently, I bought the Willings, this little thing, these little small devices that you put in your pocket. And these things help you to calculate your, to compute your footsteps daily, so to see if you have spent a healthy day or not. And in the meantime, it, it can uh, compute other things uh, like a sleeping time and so on. So all these connected devices has encouraged me to study the sensors are used in these devices and therefore, it inspired me to the goal of today. So today's purpose will try to predict physical activity using measurements came in from a sensor. In our case, it will, be, it will be the accelerometers. Activity to predict are walking, jogging, or even sitting. This case of user's case can be used by doctors, for example, to do healthcare, to monitor their patient's health status if they suffer from obesity or other problems, physical problems. So the accelerometers, it's a mention sensor. It helps us compute the proper accelerations. It's used, already used in uh, many of uh, phone applications to estimate your arrival time at a destination. And uh, an acceleration uh, measurement contains four information, the timestamp and the three forces according to the three axes, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. The unit is meter per second per second, and the accelerometer are making a lot of measurements during time. And all these successive measurements collected successfully on an interval of time are called time series. So what we're going to do is to collect all these time series and to save it somewhere. So I've implemented an Android application that captures the, the sensor's uh, information, post it into a REST server, and then we store it into a database. The screen are much simple. So we look to from the right to the left. The first welcoming screen, you have to put your URL, your server URL, where you are going to post your data. Then when you push the start button to, to collect the data, you'll see you'll have another push button to start uh, really posting the data, and then you can stop it at any time. And you can see the data updating in real time. So now as we know how to collect our data from our smartphone, from our sensor. Yes, I didn't say it, but all the smartphone contains a lot of sensors, and the accelerometer is one basic sensor that you can find in every smart smartphone. So now we need to store all the data. And to store the data, I choose Cassandra as a solution. Did anyone, did anyone know Cassandra here? Oh, great. <laughs> anyone used Cassandra? Nice, few people. <laughs> Not you, Pierre. <laughs> so let's have a quick re reminder. Cassandra has, cre has been created by Facebook. It's an open source project since 2008. And the recent version of Cassandra was released the last Monday, the 3.0 version. Cassandra is a NoSQL database, colon oriented, which tends more towards um, distributed table abstraction type. Cassandra is scalable, masterless, really, really simple to operate, 
To get started with, we, have, we can have multi-data centers with Cassandra, which contribute to have a continuous availability. So, to write in Cassandra, Cassandra uses the last write win principle. So here, what you are, going, we are, what you are seeing is the SQL, the Cassandra query language. And here we'd like only to insert user data, login name and uh, the age. So what happens is that we create the SS table on, the, on our disk. We have a row with our login and two columns with the values, and each column will have an auto-generated timestamp. And if we'd like to update this data, for example, we'd like to update the age, what happens is that we are ha we're going to have a new SS table with a new value, and the column will have a new timestamp. And then when we try to delete this information, try to delete the age, we'll also have a new, new, a new SS table with a tombstone, which is the mark that uh, indicates the, the value does, not, does no more exist. So, as you all have seen, if we'd like to select the age, what happens? What we're going to do is to get all this SS table to our memory, read all of them, and get the column with the latest timestamp. In our case, it will be the last one, which indicates that the value does no more exist. As you have seen, each time we do an insert, an update, or delete, we create a SS table on our disk. So even a row in Cassandra could contain two billions of columns, we can reach this limitation. Therefore, there is an automatic mechanism called compaction, which runs automatically, reads all the SS table, create a new one, copy the value of the columns in this new SS table, and remove the older one. That's great. But remember, we're trying to save our accelerometer data, which are produced each time. And if the compaction occurs, we're going to lose most of our information. Therefore, we're going to choose another, another way to, to, to modelize our data. We're going to use historical data. So we're going to use also time series, time series data model. So the first step is to identify the properties that are not, are not going to change. The user ID, for example, and the timestamp. Then we create our table. Our table here will be the accelerometers, which contains the accelerometers values. We'll have our user ID as a partition key and the timestamp as a clustering column. So as you see, we have a compound primary key. And then when we store the data, our logical view will be like this. We'll have for each line the user ID, the timestamp, and the different values of our uh, forces uh, according to the three axes. And the, 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 on the disk, we'll have a row identified by the user ID. We have a column containing the timestamp values and subcolumns with the, the three axis values. That's nice. But since I'm going to capture all these accelerometers values, and these values are occurring each second, each millisecond, 100 milliseconds, I'm posting my data. So if we do some computation, I think we'll reach this limitation of columns in, uh, in basically one month. And to avoid reaching this limitation of uh, saving data in Cassandra, we can add another information. For example, we can save data, data daily. So we are capturing data each day, each second, etc. So here what I do, it's my partition key who will contain two information instead of one. I'll have the user ID and the date. And then my logical view will be like this. I'll have my user ID, the date of the saving, and then my timestamp and the values. And the most interesting thing, of course, is the disk view, disk layout. I'll have a row for each day. So I'm sure I'm not going to reach this limitation, and I'm going to store all my data as, uh, as wanted. Then, with this type of uh, modelizations, we can do range queries. So each time I'd like to get all the information to do the analysis of the computations, 
I'm going to specify to uh, specify my partition key, which is the user ID and the date in my case, and then precise the interval of getting to get all the columns containing in this slice. There is another way to do it also. If we'd like, for example, we are capturing uh, data from our accelerometers and would like to read the latest data first, that's more interesting if we'd like to do prediction. So we can add a clustering order to our table. And it's pretty much important in my case. So here I added a clustering order to, cluster, to order my clustering column, which is timestamp, the, at the descent order. I'll get the, first, the latest acceleration first. And if you don't need to save your data all the time and you need to use it only for, uh, for during a, a little time, you can use the time to leave option. So you only have the, your accelerometer data to analyze it in, in the few five or 20 sec common seconds, and then you don't need it anymore. So to free your database, you can use the time to leave option to do it. For example, it can be used to detect payment fraud. You don't need to store all the payment uh, events. You store, you store to the data for a temporary time. You analyze it. You didn't detect anything. Then, you then the data will be removed. OK. Now, we have seen how to store our data in Cassandra. And the next step will be to analyze this data. And to analyze the data, I used Spark. So. Who knows Spark? I think everyone, no? Okay. Whoever used Spark? A few, yeah, nice. <laughs> so, quick reminder too, Spark was created by AmpLab. It's an open source project since 2010. Uh, the current version was released also last Monday, the 1.5.2 version, and the Spark is totally written in Scala. Yeah. Spark is a big data processing framework. It's a fast cluster computing. So it's uh, built around the speed, the ease of use, and the sophisticated analytics. It's supported by Databricks. If we have a look to the Spark ecosystem, the main interesting thing in the Spark ecosystem is the Spark core. It, the Spark core is a major project. It provides in-memory computing capabilities to deliver speed and generali generalized execution model to support. And uh, also Spark Core can, uh, integer, uh, can contain a lot of following language. You can find its API in Java, in Scala, in Python, and even in R. And another, other this, than the Spark Core API, there are additional libraries that came above Spark with additional uh, computed capabilities. There is a Spark SQL, which computes structured data using data frames, Spark streaming to stream data and use historical data, MLlib library to do some ma machine learning algorithm, and graphics <coughs> sorry, to build and transform and reason <coughs> sorry, about graph uh, structured data at scale. And Spark integrates, works with a lot of data sources. There is <coughs> a lot of data sources that came pre-packaged pre -packaged with the Spark, such as HDFS, Hive, and so on. And some other sources are, for, are provided with a data source API so developers can implement their own solution to connect their data sources to Spark. And we'll see one with Cassandra. Spark is based on one famous thing, the RDD, the Resilient Distribution Dataset. RDD are a collection of objects that can be stored on a disk across a cluster, of course, or in memory. RDD can be operated in parallel, and they are fault tolerant. So what we do with RDD is we get our data sources, we do a lot of transformation as needed, we compute all the transformations that we need, and then we can apply an action and have the final result. So we'll have a little simple how to 
work with Spark. It's the famous Spark symbol, how to do word count. Here, I would like to read data from a text file to see how many times the, <coughs> the word occurs, and then keep only words that occurs more than three times. The first step is to initialize our Spark configuration. We specify our application name and then the masters of our Spark here. We, it will run at local with uh, a lot of executors as needed. And then we initiate our Spark, the Java Spark context. I'm using, I'm using the Java API. And after all, we can apply our transformation. Here, we read first the file, our text file. We're going to split all the text into words so we get an RDD of words. And then we apply a lot of transformation to our words RDD. First, we, can, we create a tuple of, of uh, words. For each word, we're going, we're going to, to give uh, one as the first value. Then we reduce all the value to compute the sum for uh, every, every occurrence of words. And after all, we apply filter to keep only tuples containing uh, occurrence that is uh, more than three. That's what we need. And at the end, after doing all the transformation, we can apply our action, which is to collect our data. Here, I apply it collection, collecting, which uh, gives us a list of tuples at the end. So, <clears throat> so Sparks runs on a cluster. It runs as an independent set of processes on a cluster. Uh, coordinated, of course, by the Spark uh, context object. And the Spark context can connect a lot to various uh, cluster managers, either in standalone mode, local, or Mesos or YARN. And then the cluster manager will allocate the needed resources and will acquire executor's node to, do, to run all the computation defined in our application code. So, Spark is fast flexible, and easy to use. I saw that uh, a few hands raised uh, uh, that, uh, of people that use the Spark. I'm a Spark Padawan, and I really enjoyed starting with Spark, and it wasn't hard at all. Now, what we need to do is to do real-time analysis. We are, we are going to have a time series in real time, so it will be interesting to have communica communication between our Spark and Cassandra to do real-time analysis. So we're going to use a, a specific a custom connector to connect Spark to Cassandra. It's an open source project implemented by DataStax. The current version is 1.5. Uh, it's totally written in Scala. And what the connector does, it loads data from Cassandra into Spark, and it can read write the result from Spark into Cassandra. So, to resume, the connector exposes Cassandra tables as RDD or, streams, uh, or Spark disk streams. The Spark configuration won't really change. We're going only to add two properties to the Spark configuration. In our case, it will be our Cassandra URL and the port to use. And then, if you'd like to read the table from Cassandra, we're going to call our connector API. Here, we indicate our um, uh, space name, key space name, and our table, which, which, we, which are training. And then, after getting our Cassandra rows RDD, we're going to apply queries to get very, the very specific information. Here, I'm, I'm going to have my timestamp for each user and each activity. I'll go, I'm going, after all, to map all the rows I will get to my, from Cassandra into a map, so to have uh, all the values, and then I will only get the values of the timestamp and cache it. That's the action. Put it in a cache. But to stream it, I'm going to need Spark Streaming, which is another module of Spark. And Spark Streaming, if you, one of you has followed the conference about Spark Streaming uh, yesterday, I think, uh, it's a high scalable throughput fault tolerant stream processing. It allows you to create batches of streams to compute it 
and then you have your result, your result process. And here how we do it in Java. So instead of calling this Java Spark context, we're going to initiate a Java streaming context instead. And we are going to, hit to give him also the duration of our batches. So here it's two seconds. Oh, it's two seconds we're going to stream data to compute all what we're going to, to need and then to have the result for each two second stream. What I'm going to need is to read the data from Cassandra instantly in real time and then compute my, my results. So there is no Cassandra receiver yet. So I implemented my own Cassandra receiver, which allows me to get my results after computations. And after all, we have to apply our action. In my case, it's pretty easy. I have only to print my, my computation. And after all, you're going to indicate to our Java streaming context to start and the, the termination condition, which is here when the computation are, are finished. If we have a look to our Cassandra receiver, what I needed is only to, to extend the receiver Spark class and to override the on start methods. I have to implement my own receive methods with all the computation I have to do and all the instructions. And that's all. Pretty easy, huh? So, we, see, we have uh, seen how to store data on Cassandra, how to stream it with Spark. I have my custom Cassandra receiver. What we're going to do now is how to predict our results. Remember, we're going to recognize our physical activity. And the possible physical activity are walking, jogging, standing, or sitting. We're going to use the measurement came in from our accelerometer, our time series. So here, we are facing a classification problem. We will try to classify our time series into physical activity classes. We're going to use machine learning. Ah. <laughs> So the problem is multi-class multi -class classification. We go into label and unknown patterns using known patterns. There is a lot of algorithms that exist. The first one, logistic regression. Okay, nice. Let's have a look. The logistic regressions do binary solution, success, fail, uh, and then we cannot apply this solution to our case. We're going to classify into multiple classes, walking, jogging. So there is another version of, log of logistic regression called multinominal logistic regression, which takes into account a lot of solution and classes to classify. But the problem with logistic regression that it's using, it doesn't support uh, independence between variables. In our case, all the values that we're going to capture from our sensor are independent. We don't know. There is no link between the values. So then we have another solution, which is called naive basis. Naive basis classifier, based on the three RM, do the, use the uh, independence assumption of features. So for example, to give you just a small example, you have a tiny object with a spheric uh, shape with a red color, you can say, OK, oh, it's an apple. But the naive basis is outperformed uh, by other approaches, such as random forest. And that's why I'm going to use the random forest. The random forest operates by constructing a multitude of decision trees at training time, of course. So we have to build our decision tree with a different features value. And then we have to use it to predict our data. Why I use it, the random forest? I test it. I use the random forest and the decision tree in the meantime. I computed my accuracy. And then I found that with random forest, I had a higher accuracy. So we're going to use Spark MLib to do all the computation, all the algorithm of machine learning. Here we are facing a supervised learning. We're going to train a model, 
and then we give him a new features and we're going to ask him to predict the act physical activity. So training means collecting training data. Uh, and then we have to collect the label data. We have to identify the feature, the characteristic of our information, extract the information, you know, gain the knowledge. We have to compute all these features. And then we have to create and train our model, which will be our random forest model. And after all, we can do our prediction. I'm just going to do a special thanks to all my friends and colleagues who helped me collect my training data. It wasn't pretty easy to find volunteers running during break times with the phone on the bucket and so on. So, guys, thanks. To collect the data, I created my training table containing the user ID, the activity, because we know which activity we are going to do the timestamp and the different forces values. And as you see here, my uh, partition key are, is composed by the user ID and activity. So then, I have my Android phone. To, to, uh, I added a new activity to my Android phone too. You, have, you see there is another button with collect data on it. And then when you push the button, when you click on the button, you'll have a new menu where you can write your name you have a drop list, you select the activity to do, then you push the start button. And when you click on the start button, the sensor, you will hear a sound. You can try it, huh? all the sources are available on GitHub. You will hear a sound, a little beep sound, that uh, announces the posting of the data. And it, just, it, uh, stay, it uh, lasts uh, 20 seconds duration of uh, the posting data. And then you will hear another sound. You know, you have to stop. And after collecting all the training data on my Cassandra database, I have to, to compute the features. But before showing you the feature, I just want to be very, very clear. There is no big data here. I only get a few data for my training model. Of course, we can do it, but I have to find a billion of volunteers to do it. You can do it, guys, huh? OK. So I had my data. I had my time series saved on my Cassandra table. The first thing to do with my training data is to prepare it. And how to prepare it, I have to slice into windows. You know, when you save your, the, the audio, the mic, the, your voice or singing or so on, when you see the, 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 the shape of the, of the graph, it's really tense. So it's the same with the time series. You have to zoom in to, to, to see the good shape of your, of your graph. And therefore, we're going to slice into a tiny time interval. I choose a two seconds interval. And for each interval, we're going to identify the features, extract the information from this tiny interval, and then compute it. Here, for example, we have two time series of two physical actions. You see one is sitting and the other one is standing. And just by looking to the two uh, graph, you can uh, immediately identify some features. Look at the blue line. When you're sitting, the blue line is below the green and the red one. And when you're standing, it's the, the blue line uh, comes above the, the two other graphs. So here we have one feature, one simple feature. OK, I can compute the difference. When I'm sitting, I know that the Y graph will be below. And when I'm standing, it's the, the, it will be above. OK, that's the first feature. Very easy, huh? More complicated one. If you are walking or jogging, here we see the frequency of our uh, measurement. When you are walking, you have an amplitude, very slow amplitude, and when you're jogging, you have a lot of peaks. So here you can say, OK, you can, we can measure our amplitude peak to peak. So we can see the difference if I am walking or jogging. That's a feature. Well, that's not enough. We have to 
gets a lot of other features. Don't worry, everything exists on the internet. All the studies have been done, all the statistic statistical studies. So just by using Google, you can find a lot of other features that what are used. We can measure the average acceleration, the difference that I show you for sitting and standing, the variance, the, st the standard deviation, the average absolute difference, the resultant acceleration, etc., and the, for, of course, the peak-to-peak -peak ampl uh, amplitude for the y-axis, for example. So, how it works in, uh, with the MLlib library? First, what I have to do is to get all my acceleration data. Here I get an RDD of an array, double array containing the, the x, y, and z values. I have to transform it into a vector, because the MLlib library works with vectors, statistic. Yeah. And then you have to call the multivariate statistical summary which contains a lot of computation already defined, like mean, variance, you don't have to do anything. A lot of methods already exist. And if you like to do some specific uh, computation for your feature, you can do it by reusing some methods from uh, this class. Okay, we compute all our features, and then we go to insert all the feature into a vector and create a labeled point. The label point is, the, is uh, the main important thing about uh, decision tree model or random forest model. All these training models are based on label point to train them. Label point, it means that we, we're going to insert value with a label, with, uh, with a precisely a label and a vector with a lot of features already computed. Then we're going to create our Decision tree, for example, to compare between decision tree and random forest. So, the first thing is to initialize all the parameters. You can, you're not, uh, it's not necessary to, uh, to modify all the default values. Here, I used almost all default values only for the max depth. I chose 20 depth to, to, to navigate on my decision tree. And then, we have only to, co to call the decision tree class with the training methods. And the training methods will initiate a, a decision tree model. The training data, so I didn't precise this. To train our model, we have to get all the training data, that's what uh, is suggests, to split the data into uh, training data and test data. So I will take 60% of the data to the training data, to the training set, and for testing, we'll keep the 40%. Here I created my model, and then I saved it to reuse it for prediction, of course. And after all, I did some computation to see the accuracy of my model by testing my, using my test data, of course. Okay. And for the rest, the random forest, there is no difference, no big difference. We have only some parameters, um, more some parameters. For example, the number of tree we're going to use. Here I'm going to use 10 trees in my random forest. And the subset strategy too. I, keep the, I kept the automatic strategy. And you have to choose a value to do random seeds. That's I, I put it a default value without, without really thinking about it. And then, after all, we computed all the values with the testing data. So, to remember, I had uh, 13,000 of, uh, 13, of training acceleration, 50 features at all, if we count all the features among the three axes. I get 26 label points to my model and then I computed the accuracy. So for the decision tree accuracy, I got 69%, but for the random forest accuracy, I had 92.3%, and that's why I used the random forest. Okay, so now let's see all this works.
I'm going to share my screen. Yep. Oops, oh, here we go. So first of all, I'll show you my tiny, oh, it's really tiny, my REST API. I used Spring Boot just to initialize a, a small server to post data on it from directly from my Android phone. That's really, really, really basic. So I'll have to start it. Yep. I added the like inf information here. I don't know if you're seeing everything. Yep. And then I'll show you my Android phone too. So just going to get my network. Okay. So the camera has to zoom in two seconds. I'll show you. Yep. Okay. Here we go. Uh, can you show the camera? Ah, I move. Up. Ah, okay. <laughs> Oops. So here, as you see, I started my accelerometers app. I only set my uh, URL to my server, and then um, after all, I'm going to click on the start button. But before clicking to the start button, I have to start my uh, my Spark. So the first thing to do after starting the application that I'm going to show you the result. That'll be the latest result. Yes, that was for yesterday production, okay? It will be refreshed every two seconds or three seconds, I think. So you have to move to the spark part. Up. And here it is. So I have my prediction service when I initiate my Spark configuration here, I, I indicated my Cassandra URL, which is in local. To, uh, all of the things are runs on, on local. And then I'm going to call the protection with real, real time, which is here. And then you'll see I, I called my Cassandra receiver. And then I'm going to print the result after the streaming. If we go to see our Cassandra receiver here, I just initiate uh, initiate my random forest. I load my random for, random forest uh, mo model. I get all the data from Cassandra. I do the computation, and then I try to save to store my prediction result. I could show you a little small of the computation I did. Hmm, there's a lot of computation to do. So here you see all my uh, features. I'm going to zoom a little bit. Yep. The mean, the variance, the standard deviation, the average absolute difference, etc., etc. And then I get my array of features for each axis. This is for the x, the y, and the z, and so on. Then I, I, I created my vectors, which is used to create my labeled point and even to predict. So here we go. We're going to start our prediction service. Yep. I'll put the two screens together. Yep, so we see both the flags. As you see, here streaming has been started, so, so it's, it's already been streaming the latest data from Cassandra. And now I'm going to push the start button here. Yep, and now here you start seeing the accelerometers uh, real-time data. And then we're going to have our prediction, of course. Okay. Yep. Here I'll be standing. I know, I'm not joking. <laughs> standing, yeah. 
great. And now, if I'm sitting, so the phone will be like here, if I'm sitting. Working, no. Sitting, great. And I'll be working. <laughs> working, how oh, nice. And if I do some jogging, some morning jogging. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> no? No jogging? <laughs> no, it doesn't want us. Yeah, jogging. <laughs> OK. That was fun, huh? <laughs> of all these stuff. Okay. Oop. So, in conclusion, what we have seen is how to collect data from a device connected device, which is a smartphone here in our case, and analyze it. We have a lot of possibilities. I use only the accelerometers, but we can combine a lot of sensors. There is a gyroscope sensor which, counts, uh, which captures the rotation movement. So, for example, if you'd like to uh, uh, develop an application for to start dancing, for example, and then you can have the great, the effective steps of dancing for salsa, tango, and so on, by combining acceleration sensor and the gyroscope. So there is a lot of, um, uh, of possibilities with IoTs. And this presentation, it's only small, simple, to show you how to do it, and to show you the easiest way to do it, of course, and to inspire you to do your own IoT-connected devices. So thank you. I think we have a lot of time for questions. We have 13 minutes left. So, any questions? Or oh, if you'd like to see the demo running after all, I can, I can show you too after the presentation, of course. Yeah. Yes, uh, so the question is, did you play it with time to get the batch uh, batch interval seconds. Yes, I did it. It's a tricky way uh, with prediction. It's a very, very sensitive, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's a very, very sensitive uh, parameters. So I tried with one second, with two seconds, with five seconds, and doing all these tests, I tested tests, I found that two seconds is the appropriate duration to do in my uh, prediction. Yes. It's a very personal choice. It depends on your data. So you have to, to try at various uh, values. Other questions? I think no questions this morning. <laughs> Yes, I was waiting for this question. Thank you. <laughs> so the question was, I was, I was doing all this stuff asynchronously. I, I collect the data, store to Cassandra, and then I'm going to do, uh, start my streaming after all. And yes, of course, the best way to do it is to do it in a synchronous time. So I thought of, uh, that will be my next presentation, maybe. I thought about using Kafka. So we can post data directly into Kafka and, uh, inspire, instead of storing the data into Cassandra. And then we can analyze the data directly and, and, and compute all the features. Yeah. If I understood correctly, you had some sort of a window where you calculate your features inside this window of two seconds. Yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, are you put at this feature possibility to do analysis, let's say, of a sliding window shifting over your data 
so the window, uh, the question was, um, if I did understood all of it, so I choose uh, two seconds as a period to slice my training data and to create my windows to compute all the features after all. And then how to use all this information First, for this part, for the training data, it's really personal choice. You can choose the, the window time you, you like. And it's only used for training step to create the, the label point for our training model. After all, for the prediction, I didn't use the same thing. For the prediction, I, get, I didn't show you, maybe. I get only the latest rows saved in Cassandra. Mm, let's see here. Up. Uh, I put the queries uh, on my class. Yep, Cassandra queries. Uh, I don't know if you can see it here, but I get the the latest uh, the latest data acceleration total here. I get only the hundred of latest uh, acceleration saved into Cassandra to do my prediction. So I didn't use the, the window thing and so on. I only get the last uh, saved uh, data and analyzed for the prediction. Yep. Other questions? So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for coming.